Spain, live from somewhere in uh, Northern California. I know where, but I'm not telling. Robert Anton Wilson. Bob, good morning. Good morning. Nice to uh, talk to you again. It's been a while since we've chatted. And, you know, I was thinking this morning, probably the hardest part of this interview is introducing you. I know you as an author, of course, but you're such a, uh, 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 a subversive, a rascal, a scoundrel, a troublemaker. I'm not sure how else to introduce you. Could you introduce you? Ontologist. A what? Gorilla ontology. <laughs> That'll do. I want to thank you for uh, getting up early. I suspect you did on this Sunday morning. And uh, uh, Millennium Madness is an event that's coming up here in Los Angeles on Saturday, May 29th. And I know Tim Leary's going to be there, and uh, Paul Krasner, Jack Herrer, and and of course you. One of the uh, parts of this event, this Millennium Madness event, is uh, the Cosmic Conspiracy Game, which I understand you wrote and and have a lot of experience playing. Can you tell us a little about that? What is the Cosmic Conspiracy Game? Well, the Cosmic Conspiracy Game is a, a lot of fun. Every time I've organized one, everybody has agreed they had a lot of fun. But it's also teaching a great deal about... Uh, uh, the way we make assumptions. Everybody in the game is lying and knows everybody else is lying, but still uh, people uh, fall into all sorts of traps and it teaches you how to be more aware of uh, how uncritical our thinking generally is and how most of the reality we experience is based on our own uncritical thinking, our assumptions that we project outward and perceive as part of reality. Boy, this, you have no way of knowing this, but this dovetails perfectly with the conversation uh, that we were just having here about uh, victims. I'm getting so frustrated dealing with victims, people who call the show, Bob, and say, you know, my life uh, is not working. I'm, I'm not having any fun. Uh, it sucks. But, of course, I have nothing to do with it. Yeah, the well, being a victim is very popular these days. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it's been popular for 2,000 years. Is it getting worse? Are, are we more a victim than before? Well, we got more. We got more reasons to explain it now. In Christianity, you are a victim because God is inscrutable, and we all have original sin anyway. Because Eve ate the apple, so let's blame the women. But now we got all sorts of other. Maybe it's our genes. Maybe it's our Oedipus complex. Maybe it's our conditioned reflexes. Maybe it's the social system is structured wrong. Maybe it's the damn bankers. So we got all sorts of reasons to feel victimized. Besides, we all belong to a minority. 220% uh, of the population belongs to at least one minority. <laughs> so if it serves us to say, I'm being oppressed because I'm in this minority, we often do that. Well, yeah, and it's easy enough to prove. For instance, I'm a white male. Everybody is down on us. But we're actually a minority. So we got, <laughs> we got a right to organize and fight for our rights and, and call ourselves victims. We're, we're an exploited minority. I wonder it's if. only minority it's respectable to despise. I wonder if, if technology, uh, the, the fact that it's sort of, uh, faceless and, uh, uh monolithic and, uh, what am I saying? That, that we don't really understand technology anymore. We're using all these technical goodies and we don't really aside from knowing how to put the battery in or plug it into the wall we've really got no idea what's going on inside you think that could to exacerbate this problem of feeling like a target or a victim or an effect of life yeah absolutely people uh people remain ignorant and then they feel that the, the environment is hostile because they don't know how to deal with it I, I am happy to say my daughters are both excellent automobile mechanics they never feel victimized by uh, garages because they usually fix their own cars. If they can't, they take it to somebody they know they can trust because they've watched him and they see he's not cheating. If people learn how to handle technology, they're not victims anymore. You know, Robert, um, I read your book, The Cosmic Trigger, about nine or ten years ago as I was backpacking through the Sierras. And, and on a solo backpack trip, it was one of those I really want to get away and I'm taking the cosmic trigger with me. What a trip that was to read it in that context, that situation. And something from that book that's occurring to me now as we talk about this is that passage about, and again, it's been a decade, so you might have to help me out, that passage about discovering that um, even though looking at a, like a Playboy uh, fold-out, a Playboy centerfold or a Hustler magazine picture of... of naked women that arouses men in other words their perception of even a picture of a woman 
And you talk about using a magnifying glass and seeing, my God, it's just dots of ink on a page. And yet here the, the, the physical body gets aroused um, as if it were a real woman out there. Uh, what was the conclusion to that? What, what was that proving or, or well, illustrating? Uh, <laughs> it's my variation of the old Buddhist parable about the guy who sees the snake and drops out of a heart attack. Another guy comes along and sees a rope and walks right over it. The Buddha comes along and sees energy that his mind is organizing into a rope. It, uh, it's true. I'm, uh, uh, we're all subject to the same psychological uh, laws. I, I get turned on by sexy photos myself, but uh, I know they're only photos. It's, uh, uh, that's relatively benign in spite of the fact that both feminists and uh, Christian fundamentalists find it appalling. It's, it's relatively harmless to be uh, aroused by a photograph, but people are aroused by words and ideas that are just as uh, symbolic, and sometimes words and ideas will drive them to commit murder, sometimes it'll drive them to mass suicide. I guess it's the power of imagination that I'm looking for here, the, the idea that, as we were talking about earlier on the show here this morning, that reality is really more a function of perception than anything objective. Yeah, uh, reality is the temporary resultant of the perpetual struggle between rival gangs of people who think they can define reality for everybody else. <laughs> well, it's hard enough just to define it for ourselves. But getting back to the news photos, uh, I, got, I didn't think that one up. Uh, that was pointed out by a friend of mine uh, named Maliclips the Younger, the omnibenevolent polyfather of virginity and gold and high priest of the head temple of the Discordian Society. If you take the sexiest photo and use high enough magnification and stare at the part that you find most exciting, uh, it, it dissolves into a bunch of dots. That, that's really a mystical experience. You're practically a Buddha at that moment when you realize you're being turned on by your own imagination and a few minimal clues provided by the photographer. Increasingly, I have uh, felt that um, even though my uh, 60s values about peace and love uh, uh, still, I still feel strongly about those as values. Increasingly, I'm seeing that um, the way I, the, the, how can I say this, the direction in which I'm evolving also has a lot to do with supplementing peace and love with critical thinking, with more choices, with creativity, and not stopping with that one right answer, but again, recognizing that. That imagination is a very creative process in a in a very real way. I mean, it's not just fantasy or illusion that we're talking about when we talk about imagination. Yeah, well, peace and love is uh, I'm all for them, but uh, if you don't have a, if you don't have a, a, a critical intelligence, you're going to be victimized over and over until you lose all your peace and love and turn very bitter and probably become a paranoid. There's an old Sufi story about a Sufi who taught a snake not to kill. And he came back a year later, and the snake was all beat up and really a terrible, a tragic case. And he said, what happened? And the snake told him, I became nonviolent. And the Sufi said, wait a minute, I told you not to kill. I didn't tell you not to hiss. Ah. <laughs> that's very nice. This Millennium Madness 93, uh, coming up May 29th at the Scottish Rite, is apparently the first of uh, a series of annual events that will sort of count down the 90s as we approach this new millennium, uh, the third millennium, the 21st century. Um, are you a, more of a, a optimist or a pessimist? How do you control your pessimism? And, and, and what do you think of, about this uh, next seven years as we approach the year 2000 is such incredible change my, happening. My big hope is that in 2001 we'll find that black monolith and we'll get close enough to find on the bottom of it it says rosebud. Is that what the crop circles are? Uh, well, okay, yeah. The crop circles will eventually spell out the word rosebud. Rosebud. <laughs> the, no, I'm an, I, I avoid pessimism by the simple fact that I, uh, I find so many things to do. The only people who have the real leisure to be pessimists are people who have given up and don't do anything and they can sit around and concentrate all day on how miserable they are and how hopeless the world is but if you keep busy doing things uh, you don't have time to be a pessimist 
I asked your friend uh, Timothy Leary once a few years back if he was optimistic, and he looked at me like I was crazy, and he said, well, yeah, but what choice do I have? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> who starts uh, who, who passes exams? People are optimistic enough to think that they are smart enough to memorize the data. Who gets jobs? People who think they're attractive and smart enough to win the interview game. Uh, who gets the best uh, sex partners? Those who are optimistic enough to think they're very attractive. The pessimists lose all the time. It's very fashionable to be a pessimist in literary circles especially, but they never tell you if you really make a consistent career out of being a pessimist, you're going to be a loser all the time. Who wants that kind of one? No. You have to be more aware of uh, how uncritical our thinking generally is and how most of the reality we experience is based on our own uncritical thinking, our assumptions that we project outward and perceive as part of reality. Boy, this you have no way of knowing this, but this dovetails perfectly with the conversation Live from somewhere in uh, Northern California. I know where, but I'm not telling. Robert Anton Wilson. Bob, good morning. Good morning. Nice to uh, talk to you again. It's been a while since we've chatted. And, you know, I was thinking this morning, probably the hardest part of this interview is introducing you. I know you as an author, of course, but you're such a, uh, 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 a subversive, a rascal, a scoundrel, a troublemaker. I'm not sure how else to introduce you. Could you introduce... Oncologist. A what? Gorilla ontology. <laughs> That'll do. I want to thank you for uh, getting up early. I suspect you did on this Sunday morning. And uh, uh, Millennium Madness is an event that's coming up here in Los Angeles on Saturday, May 29th. And I know Tim Leary's going to be there, and uh, Paul Krasner, Jack Herrer, and and of course you. One of the uh, parts of this event, this Millennium Madness event, is uh, the Cosmic Conspiracy Game, which I understand you wrote and and have a lot of experience playing. Can you tell us a little about that? What is the Cosmic Conspiracy Game? Well, the Cosmic Conspiracy Game is a, a lot of fun. Every time I've organized one, everybody has agreed they had a lot of fun. But it's also teaching a great deal about... Uh, uh, the way we make assumptions, everybody in the game is lying and knows everybody else is lying, but still uh, people uh, fall into all sorts of traps and it teaches 